Hey everyone, we are doing a special giveaway to celebrate our one year anniversary of the podcast. That's right, Fishing the DMV is one year old. It's pretty exciting. And to celebrate the occasion, we're giving away a fishing trip with Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Services. He operates out of the Shenandoah River and the Upper Potomac River. And we're giving you four unique ways that you can try to win an opportunity to fish with him. Number one, all online orders with Jake's Bait and Tackle. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle website, whatever you order, in the comments section of your order, just put the hashtag fishing the DMV and you enter a chance to win. Number two, all orders in person. Just go to the store and say you'd like to enter the contest. Again, hashtag fishing the DMV. That's two ways. Number three, if you don't have any money, if you're one of my younger audience, because I know I have a lot of kids that listen to the podcast, I'm giving you two ways that you can do it that's absolutely free. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review of Fishing the DMV podcast. And at the end of your review, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV and you had a chance to win. Now, I'm going to give you a fourth way that you can enter the competition. On every video that drops from November 15th to December 15th, every new video that, that's on the channel, in the comments section, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV. Now, here's a caveat. It's every video. So if you miss one video, I'm not going to be able to count you. But it's free. All you got to do is in every new video from November 15th to December 15th, in the comment section, just leave the hashtag fishing the DMV and you have a chance to win. So four ways if you want to make an order online and leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle in person and tell them hashtag fishing the DMV. Number three, leave a review of the podcast on Apple podcast with the hashtag fishing the DMV. And number four, on every new video that drops from December I'm sorry, from November 15th to December 15th, leave the hashtag fishing the DMV in the comments section, and that gives you four unique opportunities to win. The contest winner will be announced Saturday, December 17th at Jake's Bait and Tackle's All Day Christmas Seminar Bash. Again, contest winner will be announced December 17th, that Saturday, at Jake's Bait and Tackle's Christmas Seminar Bash. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. We are back and we got a we got the main treat here. How are you guys doing? We're doing really well. Uh, it's a great day today. Um, can't ask for better weather. Weather. We got a couple of nice fish species from the Shenandoah to show people today, and they're really engaged. And we got to talk to them about what we do. So mm -hmm. it's good stuff. And then, so is this like your first day or like, why don't, why don't you tell everyone at home, like, how did you get involved with this guy and what, what led you on in this journey? Yeah, definitely. So I uh, did a four year program. I attended Longwood University. And so I did an integrated environmental sciences program there. Got my bachelor's of science and I did a lot of uh, biology, wildlife oriented work um, as far as concentration courses. And I also got involved in research early on in undergrad. And I did things spanning from water quality work in the Chesapeake all the way to some fisheries work with the Department of Wildlife Resources um, out of Farmville, Virginia. And so that's kind of where I got my start. And I knew from there I was hooked and I wanted to do something related to fisher fisheries if I could. Um, and so I reached out to our Verona office because originally I'm from this area. And so I was scoping out for opportunities to get a little bit more hands-on experience in the field. And um, my path wandered for a little bit. I studied a little bit longer down at Duke University's Marine Lab, got some, a little bit of taste of the marine environment in there. Um, and then thankfully, just after that program ended for me, um, the department had an opening as a, for a technician position. And so that's kind of how I got my in at the department in Verona. And I've been here for about 10 months or so, something like that now, um, coming up on one year with them almost. Um, so it's been a really great experience. Um, and it's hard to believe that I've actually been here this long because the work we do is just really fun. Um, it's great getting to have this positive impact on communities, doing outreach events like this, and also just getting that hands-on opportunity to work with the environment around you and just really be immersed in it and, and doing management and conservation work that I'm passionate about. So I had a lot of friends that were nursing students, and they always said, like, the difference between academia and then when you're actually out in the field is completely different. What is the biggest shock now that you're actually out in the field? 
I would say that it's really good to know the background information, and that is what an academic setting prepares you for. However, there's a lot of hands-on aspects that you don't learn in an academic program. Um, so, for instance, even removing it from the fisheries or wildlife side of things, people complain all the time, like, okay, I know, like, the Pythagorean theorem, but I don't know how to do my taxes. So there's this practicality aspect <laughs> um, that isn't taught in the classroom. And that's why I would recommend anyone who wants to get into this field, do as many volunteer opportunities as you can. Um, do what I did and try and get involved in research at a lab early on. Um, because those are going to give you some more hands-on skills that then transfer a little bit better into your first position, especially if it's a field-based position. Um, and so I would say, yeah, the major, major difference and big transition is just doing a lot more like hands-on, um, blue-collar-esque work when you're out in the field and um, sometimes roughing it a little bit depending on what you're doing. Um, and an academic program doesn't really prepare you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is a big jump going from like, what you're taught and then how, how you implement that actually in the real world and the outreach programs are just so important. And this was a fantastic one you guys did. Like how often do you actually do these out? Like, like I, I'm assuming you have like in your head, like how many you want to do each year, but is it, is it more common now that, that we're past COVID? Is it, is it gearing back up? Gearing back up. Um, we did take a little bit of a break uh, during the kind of the peak of COVID, um, but it's coming back again. There's a, there's a finite amount that we can do. Uh, and, and I've done as many as, you know, 20 or 30 in a, in a year, and it was way too many. Mm -hmm. um, and that was when I was in a different role. Uh, now, you know, I, I try to, the past couple of years, uh, even before COVID, I was, I was trying to hover around 10 to 15, and that seems to be like the sweet spot. A lot of them do come on the weekends. Um, and, you know, at, one, at some point, you just have to be like, all right, we're just going to do two weekend days a month. And that's the max, you know, and because we just we have to take a break. Um, and so we, we love to do it, um, but it, it's that we have to sacrifice other things to do outreach. And so, you know, we're not looking at the data on the days we're doing outreach. We're not actually actively sampling uh, the rivers and the lakes when we're doing outreach. So it's a balancing act, um, but it's probably one of the most important things that we do as a department um, just to get more people involved in nature as well as the sport of fishing and hunting. And for people that are living under a rock, um, Virginia, it's just kind of funny because, like, I just had um, I had John uh, McCulloch on. Now I don't remember his name. John McCulloch yeah. on for mm -hmm. the Maryland DNR. And Maryland's a lot smaller. So you talk about that. Like, I just run the state. And it's so crazy because Virginia is completely, it's really unique, honestly, because of its size. It's different animal. Yeah. Yep. What is your area for people that don't know that you actually run? Um, so we cover the Shenandoah Valley pretty much. Um, our region is quite large. You know, basically... You know, an easy way to look at it, it's not perfect, but the 64 corridor um, that leads to Richmond, if you draw a line north of that, is all Region 4. And so we have two offices that run that region. We have the Verona office, which we are out of, and that's the Shenandoah Valley from Winchester down to Lexington. And then uh, east of the Blue Ridge is the Fredericksburg office, and we have three biologists and a, an assistant biologist over there that run that area. So a lot of ground to cover. Um, we collaborate really well. And that's, you know, one of the great things about working for this agency is there's great people that work for us and, and we're all passionate about wildlife and fisheries. And we all, you know, are able to work well together, even across divisions. You know, we are, we're on the uh, prescribed burn crew, you know, for the department. So we help our WMA people. Um, sometimes they'll help us, you know, if we have problematic um, invasive species that are growing around the lake, like Autumn or Tree of Heaven. You know, they came out with us the other day at Lake Frederick and we were working with friends of Lake Frederick to try to eradicate some of the Autumn Olive issues and some of the Tree of Heaven. Um, so it's a big collaboration. It's, a, it's, you know, kind of a big team and uh, we work we work the best we can with the, the ground we have to cover, but uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of driving involved. You know, we have about an hour and 20 minutes to pop up here today. Um, and we have some areas that'll take almost two, two and a half hours to get to. Not, not very many, but there's a couple yeah, like, trout streams that are far that reaching. Like, that's like what you said, like, that's a big area. Do you kind of like, how far ahead do you find out your schedule? So you're not going crazy with the drive? Everyone's a little bit different. You know, we, we've got a fairly set schedule, you know, specific resources are sampled on a yearly basis, like the Shenandoah river. So we know that, you know, starting in mid September, depending on the water levels and then ending in mid October. That's going to be our strike zone for the Shenandoah River every year. So that's all the sites are on there. We hit those same spites, same spots, go out after the same species. 
Um, and so it's just kind of automatic. And so, but we also know that, you know, like you said, outreach events, if they come on the schedule, we're like, no, we can't do them, you know, during that time period. Um, and so, uh, you know, working with the, with our technicians, we have two other technicians right now, uh, as, as well as Kirsten. And so scheduling them, scheduling volunteers to help with stocking, uh, it has to be pretty, pretty solid. And so, I take a lot of pride in my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's color coded. Yes, yeah, it's really good. Like, oh, that's that's bringing uh, and guys, we got some other really cool hot topics to talk about here. But I mean, I, this is fascinating to me, especially because like how big Virginia is. When you talk about your region, how often do you meet with individuals, let's say like in Odenkirk or another region, and you guys like collaborate? Is that something that is it very siloed off, and you just generally speaking, it's just your region, and then every now and then you guys will cross pollinate to another region of Virginia? Like, how does all that work? I wouldn't call it siloed, but, you know, our we have very talented individuals in the agency. You know, they don't need their hands held and they, they, they don't need a lot of assistance unless it's a big project. Um, and so we all know that we're all slammed to the hilt with with stuff like no one's sitting around doing nothing. And so we don't really ask uh, for help unless it's a really big project. And so, for example, Kirsten went up to help them at Burke Lake this year with the water chestnut removal, uh, which is an invasive aquatic plant uh, that's starting to take over the northern part of Virginia. And so they were literally up to their knees in mud with leeches on their legs, <laughs> hand pulling this water chestnut out, you know, rather than using uh, herbicides, you know, they're trying to just physically remove the, the, uh, the, the water chestnut. Uh, I think at one point there was a giant spider on John's head. Oh yeah, didn't know about. from the trees. <laughs> Job's not always glamorous. There's like ups and downs to it for sure. It's not always holding trophy bass up for pictures, although those right. are really great moments and opportunities. Um, but it's all really important work. Yep. Yeah, you know, it's the one thing that I was going to add to uh, some of the things that Kirsten said earlier as far as like prepping for this type of work. It's, it's pretty physically demanding. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a shock sometimes to, you know, brand new technicians or interns that come and work with us. And we're just throwing around nets of fish. And it's just, you know, it's not it's not always like you don't have to be a weightlifter to do it. Obviously, I'm not a weightlifter. But you kind of have to keep in shape and I, we all kind of make sure that we're staying active on and off the clock because it's pretty easy to hurt your back. We've got a couple of people right now that, that have back injuries and, um, you know, you know, you get the probe arm after a while from holding the, the, the probe for a shocking uh, brook trout and stuff, uh, you know, tennis elbow stuff. And it's just, yeah, it's it's a it's a, it can be a tough job, but, you know, incredibly rewarding. And so that's that's just one other thing I would say beyond the academic part is like get ready to work because we're up to our knees and leeches and pulling water chestnut out of the lake. So is there a good recruitment class right now to get involved with BWR? Like, like, how is that? Because I know in certain sectors, like people are clamoring for more people to come work or no, we don't need any more. Like, how how is it right now? Is it easy to get technicians and interns or is it something like, yes, please send them all your way? Yeah, that's that's kind of the beauty of it. And Kirsten can kind of talk about this, too, as far as the competition goes out there. But, you know, luckily, you know, get get in touch with us. We have we have a volunteer um, program called the Complementary Workforce, and it's you can find it pretty easily on our website. It's under volunteer opportunities. And so we use, you know, people from various age groups. You know, there's folks that are retired that are helping us stock trout. Um, some younger people that are looking to get in the field, but just want to get out and, and do their part with the agency. Um, but we take a lot of pride in, in bringing in young people that are interested in getting in natural resources. And so we have technician positions that we, you know, have available at times, you know, right now they're all filled. Um, but we do have some interns, uh, over the summers that help us with trout stream work and stuff like that. So, you know, we've we've been um, working for many years, you know, myself and, and my predecessors, you know, basically pumping out fisheries professionals and wildlife professionals all along the way. And so it's something we take a lot of pride in, but it is competitive. Yeah, it's definitely a competitive field to break into. Um, there are opportunities, like Jason said, out there to get involved, whether that's, whether that's volunteering, um, doing an internship while you're still in college, if there's one available to you. Um, or through these lower level wage positions, um, which is what I'm doing through um, as a technician. Um, however, uh, there's not a ton of turnover in a lot of positions within this field. And so um, that's great because you want people to be in a work environment where there is retention and they want to stay. But that also means that there's a lot more competition for those positions when they do become available. Um, so it's not for the faint of heart. I think you really have to want it and you have to 
continue to network and try and build those opportunities for yourself by meeting the right people, by consistently reaching out and trying to establish yourself in the field. And once you're in the field, um, it, it can be a bit easier because you're around those people, you're working with those people that can potentially help you reach further opportunities. Um, but it's definitely not the easiest to get into initially. No. You can see what, uh, why we hired Kirsten, because she's super sharp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cause it, it's so crazy. Like, um, and, and you guys you know from the last couple of episodes we did that I really talked about invasive species. Um, you know, a lot of the comments, actually, I think it's the problem is people don't, there's not clarity in the communication line. Like, well, why don't we just put somebody from DNR at every boat ramp to check live? I'm like, well, that's not technically your job, though. Well, um, and specifically, I meant your job, your job specifically. Um, what, how would you say, like, people that check tickets and stuff, compared to what you do, like that's completely separate? Is that a different group, different agency? Yeah, I, I think sometimes people don't realize how many people we have in the agency. You know, as a whole, our agency has 400 some individuals, you know, somewhere in the 400 mark. And that spans the globe of, you know, conservation police officers, fisheries, admin people, purchasing people, HR, like that's the whole thing. And that's all across the state. And so we we have logistically we'd have no way of checking live wells, you know, at, at, at boat ramps. You just can't be there 24 seven. There can't be live well lifeguards there. And so that's just why, again, this outreach is so important to discuss why it, it can be harmful to stock these these different types of species or plants or, or, or animals in uh, different areas. Uh, and I know it can be kind of feel hypocritical because like, well, the department stocks fish. So why can't I stock a fish? What's the difference? Uh, we don't they don't take into account the amount of time uh, that we spend uh, and kind of racking our brains to determine the pros and cons of stocking a new species. And honestly, the species that we do stock have been stocked for many, many, many years. For example, muskies were stocked first back in the 60s. And so, you know, that's that's not a new fish for the area. You know, since then, you know, the, the species have adapted with this new predator in there uh, and they don't spawn really well. And so it's controlled through stocking. If something would happen. Uh, where they would be causing a problem, we could just pull the pump, you know, pump the brakes and just stop it, within the Shenandoah. There's other rivers where they do spawn, but um, yeah, I, I guess that the biggest biggest pro, uh, point I wanted to get across is that we just take a lot of time and effort to to make decisions and, and stock fish in new areas. But we really, you know, we have problems with disease issues with fish, both like in our hatcheries, in the environment, and so it's not just that like. Well, flatheads were put in the Shenandoah River. That's going to cause problems. But also, where did they come from? Do they have some sort of disease that they could introduce to other catfish species or maybe some of our other game fish, even our non-game fish? Um, you know, so we take a lot of steps in our own hatcheries to be biosecure. And so it's that's an extra frustration when, you know, we aren't we aren't allowed to bring fish in from any state, you know, because some of them are biosecure enough to bring fish in. Um, and so you know, then someone goes and just stocks the fish randomly. And it's just like, well, you know, what's, what's the point? <laughs> you know, yeah. we just, uh... And this is something, cause I, I already know the comment section when this thing uh, re-uploads, it's, it's going to blow up. It's like, well, yeah, but smallmouth aren't native to the river. It's like, yeah, but uh, John, John really, the way he said it was interesting, like there's a difference between a non-native and an invasive. Mm -hmm. And like, that's where a lot of people like don't understand the smallmouth. Yeah. It wasn't here 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's different than like the Asian carp things like that like, yeah that is an invasive that will hurt the environment right and it's and it's, it's all about perception isn't it because if you're a if you're a spot-tailed shiner a smallmouth is very invasive yeah, yeah <laughs> no, that, that is true um the difference is one's a game fish one's not um and one's incredibly detrimental to where you know you could have uh you know a, a fishery that's predominantly dominated by a single fish that no one wants to deal with um, whereas smallmouth find their niche, yes, they feed on native fauna, um, but they they don't extirpate them. Um, it's the same with the musky too. Like it doesn't. Yeah. And I, I've always said like the, the the flathead catfish and the blue catfish issue is almost like the feral hog issue in Texas because they proliferate so quickly and they'll just destroy the environment. And mm -hmm. so far, that's been proven right that they they do breed like heavily wherever yeah. they go. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the stocking is a great segue to the smallmouth. Um, and I know we were talking a little bit before we went live here about. John talking about the Upper Potomac stocking program, but then there's another stocking program going on in Virginia too. That's right. Yeah, um, we had the a settlement that occurred in Waynesboro from the the facility, uh, the Dupont facility, um, years and years ago. They used mercury in their manufacturing process, um, and that's why we have a fish health advisory on parts of the South River as well as South Fork Shenandoah 
and it continues down into the main stem um, because of PCBs. And so it's, you know, kind of lumped in there. Um, but basically they, there was a, um, some funds that came out of that that went to the front rail fish hatchery as well as uh, boat ramps. You're seeing that Morgan's Ford has is, is been restored recently. Um, that came from the settlement from the DuPont funds. And then there's two uh, new ramps on the South River and North River that just popped up from that as well. So the uh, benefits from that, that funding, are, we're seeing that in real time. And then I just stopped by the Front Royal Hatchery the other day and it looks fantastic. That's awesome. There's four brand new ponds, they're lined, uh, they're full of water already. There's uh, gate infrastructure on it so we can control the drawdown a little bit better. They're not leaking anymore. There's, there's filtration um, on the intake from Passage Creek, which before we didn't have any. This was built back in the 30s. So the infrastructure was ancient. It was built by the CCC. And so, um, you know, we just haven't had a lot of uh, work done to that hatchery in many, many years. And so what would happen is we'd pull water from Passage Creek and we'd get a handful of sunfish in naturally and they go into the ponds those sunfish would be you know two or three inches we put the the musky fingerlings in there and the sunfish were like smorgasbord <laughs> and they just pounded them so we'd draw down the pond looking for our musky fingerlings to stock or our walleye or smallmouth whatever and we would have you know a handful of musky and really big sunfish and so um it just wasn't sustainable you know it, it just we weren't able to really produce anything that well out of that hatchery. So it was time for, for some restoration there. Um, so the filtration is huge. The ponds are great. We have some uh, a harvest building with some larger raceways outdoors that are brand new. Uh, and then we have the older raceways that are still on the property. And so the plan for the coming spring is we'll be bringing some walleye brood in there. Um, actually, I think we're gonna be running catfish out of there in the fall. We don't raise catfish in Virginia. We bring them in from an outside source. And then we stock them throughout the state and it's kind of like a big catfish rodeo and it usually takes place in front royal is there log is it logistics financial reasons why not do they, it yourself with the catfish versus the we have we have done it in the past they grow slow it takes two growing seasons to get up to the size that we like um odenkirk did a study on catfish back in the 90s uh to determine uh how their survival was once we stocked the fingerlings and he found their bass candy so um, we upsize to an advanced fingerling and it takes two years to grow them to that size in Virginia because of our latitude. And so it's just too chilly. And so it takes up too much pond space. And so it's just, uh, it's easier for us to just get them from out of state. It's costly, but it's worth it because it's one of the most popular game fish in Virginia. You know, catfish anglers are up there on the list. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. everything that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so um, the catfish will be coming in in the fall and then in the spring, we'll really start doing some intensive aquaculture and we'll be getting started with uh, walleye first. We'll be able to double crop the ponds. So we'll bring in walleye, hatch them out, put them out in the ponds, uh, and then we'll stock them out when they're about an inch and a half, two inches long. And then the ponds are drained, filled back up. We bring in the smallmouth brood and we're actually going to raise them in the raceways with with walleye you can physically extract the eggs from the fish uh after giving them a little shot of hormones and you can fertilize the eggs just in a pan and then you put it in these mcdonald's jars which roll the eggs slowly and then they hatch out and they go into a little trough and then they go out into the ponds when they've absorbed their yolk sac the smallmouth are not as friendly and so they you have to make a nice little nest for them and so they have to spawn on their own Similar to the other sunfish species like crappie and and sun and bluegill, um, you know, you make a nesting area, they'll spawn on that nest, and then we release the brood back to the river, scoop out all the fry. Again, we hold them in the indoor areas just to get them, you know, acclimated. Um, sometimes we'll do some supplemental feeding then while we wait for the ponds to set up, uh, and then they're put out in the ponds. Warm water aquaculture is fascinating. With cold water stuff, with trout stuff, the, the, there's not as many variables there. You have cold water coming out of the ground. You have species of fish that have been raised on pellets for millennia. And so you just toss the feed to them and, and they're good to go. There's disease issues. There's there's all sorts of issues with all, all types of aquaculture. But with warm water, you have to build a food chain within a pond to feed the fish. And so you have to fertilize the pond. You have to grow the right type of algae, planktonic algae. The zooplankton um, start to form and they and they start to consume that algae. And then the minnows have to, are in there and they feed on the zooplankton. 
but they also have to spawn successfully so you have tiny little minnow fry to feed to the baby smallmouth or the baby walleye that you're putting in there. And so those big four things have to go right and temperature can throw that off, turbidity from the uh, from Passage Creek can flow, throw that off, and of course the, the sunfish factor back in the day when they get into the ponds yeah. can definitely throw that off. And so uh, that'll all, that, th there'll be a steep learning curve for this whole process, spawning the broodfish successfully, setting up the ponds, and then stocking the, the young smallmouth or young um, walleye into the ponds to feed on those young minnows and zooplankton. Um, but we, you know, luckily we have Maryland and West Virginia to fall back on a little bit because they're, they're doing this work already. In fact, many agencies along the East Coast are uh, confronting the problem of spawning success with smallmouth and experimenting with uh, raising smallmouth, which are traditionally very challenging to do. And so um, it's a big experiment. We'll see how it goes. But at some point in July, August, the, the young smallmouth will be, you know, about two inches long, three inches long. And that's when we'll be shipping them out of the hatchery. With predator fish, you can't hang on to them too long because the, the biggest fish will start to become a real big fish and start being cannibalistic to the other uh, the brothers and sisters. The cool thing, too, is I, I geek out about this because there's lots of cool nooks and crannies of this project. But we're going to use um, genetic um, based uh, parentage based genetics to, to, to mark these fish. And so typically when you mark a fish, you cut a fin off or you tag a fish, and then later on you're looking for the mark or looking for that tag. But with very small fish, it can be challenging to mark them. Um, sometimes you can dip them in a chemical called OTC that will stain their the otoliths. Yeah, um, I think John that. talked about that. Yeah. Um, but you have to go back, you have to sacrifice the fish, and you have to look for that staining. Um, and that can be somewhat costly just because of staff time looking for those otoliths. And then, of course, you're taking the fish out that you just stocked into the river. Mm -hmm. Um, so with parentage-based tagging, uh, it's kind of like 23andMe for fish. Hmm. And so we'll take fin clips off the adults that we bring into the hatchery. And then once we stock the uh, the young fish out into the wild in the fall, when we do our traditional sampling, we'll look for a specific age class of fish. We're going to look at one-year-old fish. And so they range anywhere from 131 millimeters to about 210 millimeters. We have to dial that in really tightly so that we can look at the contribution of stock fish within that age class. And our goal is to get a 20% bump in the age one fish. And so we'll take clips off of every fish that falls into that little window and then send it to Randolph-Macon to, to, to compare and see whether it's from some of the brood fish that we brought into the hatchery or if it's just a wild spawn fish. Why 20%? That's just a goal that, that we set um, to make an impact on the fishery. Um, you know, we, we also are looking at uh, a 15 percent increase in, in angling uh, success. And we have a lot of data, uh, population data on both the South Fork and the South River, where we do these massive depletion surveys where we're lining boats up across the river and deplete a section of all of its fish. And through some statistics, we can determine the number of fish per kilometer of river. And so we have some excellent pre data before we start stocking. Um, 20 percent is a really ambitious number. Um, to make a difference. It doesn't sound like very much, um, but, you know, we'll never be able to raise enough fish within the hatchery uh, to really make a difference on a system-wide level. Um, so if we tried to stock enough fish in the entire Shenandoah River, we probably wouldn't come close to a 20% increase because we just couldn't raise enough. Mm -hmm. The goal of this study is to target areas of the river that need the, the, the restoration. They're maybe having trouble with numerous years of, of poor spawning and make a difference within the targeted section. So we have two 16 kilometer sections that we're gonna use as research areas. Um, and then, cause we have that pre-data in both of those sections, we'll be able to go back five, six years from now and do follow-up work, both with depletions where we're sampling the fish population to see if we get an overall increase in the population, uh, as well as an angler creel survey where we'll go out and talk to anglers, interview them, see how many fish they're catching per hour and see if that has increased as well. Yeah, and that's and guys. So this is really important to know, like understand, like when you do a stocking program, what's the purpose of it? Um, and I'm, I'm listening because this is the stuff I enjoy listening to is the uh, Texas fishing game, legendary Lake Fork, all the way down there. And they said like the reason we do the stocking is 
is not to make it like a, a fantastic fishery every single year. It just makes the lows not as low when exactly. it, when it di dies back down. And when I think of it that way, like it makes sense. What you're doing here is you're supplementing. So when it goes into that lull cycle, you're not dipping down to the point that it's as bad. Yep. Um, or improving the genetics. I know with like the Shenandoah, the big fish kill, that was one thing I think we discussed like last time where it's like, do we need to improve the genetic brew that's already in there? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not about trying to just like fix the whole river system. I mean, like right. I said, that, financially, that would be insane to try to do that. Right. And, and it's, you know, stocking is just a tool for us. And you said it perfectly with taking out the sags and those year class failures or just trying to create something, you know, the, with the main stem, for example, we've had some pretty poor year classes the past four or five years. Um, you know, we're living off of a 2014 year class right now where we had a big boom spawn. And those are those like 18 inch fish that people are enjoying right now on the, on the main stem. But it's been few and far between since then. It's not like they're not spawning at all. Obviously, you go out there and you can catch some smaller fish, but you really need those above average spawns to really carry that fishery through years of, of enjoyment for anglers. And so if we can at least bump those poor year classes to average, that would be phenomenal for, for the fisheries. It's not going to solve the water quality issues, you know, and, and that's something that's that's a whole <laughs> other, whole whole other topic. And it's just, you know, we, we, we don't have a lot, of, a lot of we don't have any regulatory power over that. You know, we, we are charged with managing the fish and wildlife populations. We can't force someone to behave better and make better water quality decisions. Um, we have to kind of deal with what we what we have you know at, at the moment the cards that were dealt and so you know we can regulate anglers um but with the shenandoah river there's very little harvest that's the other benefit of having these creel surveys is you can look at the harvest data for anglers and it's like 98 percent catch and release mm -hmm. so we do have a protective slot on there um but it's really not that effective because people just aren't harvesting fish mm -hmm. and so the other tool we have is um you know outreach talking to the public and and discussing ways that they can help and in, improve uh, areas of their property or their businesses or whatever the case may be, um, teaching the, the, the youth of, of the valley to appreciate nature, appreciate ecology, and want to conserve uh, various species. Uh, and then our other tool is, is putting more fish out there and, and trying to make a difference on a population level or at least within a, a segment of the population so that people can enjoy angling. Good deal. Good deal. Um, Two more questions, because guys, I know I probably would talk about this for like six hours straight. Uh, we'll definitely have you guys both back on the show sometime, especially when you're when your schedule dies down in the winter time. Um, you guys are always a big hit when you're on the show. Uh, one thing was about we'll circle back to warm water species not being able to be pellet fed versus the cold water species like trout. Why is that? In because it would be amazing if in a perfect world you could pellet feed. Why is that not possible with warm water species? Um, I misspoke a little bit. It is possible. Okay. It is more challenging uh, with warm water species. Um, it, you know, with with our trout, we've raised them in a hatchery environment um, for their for, for generations. Mm. And so we have brood fish that we've hand selected over time for a number of different reasons, you know, survival, color, um, good fins, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and but, you know, for the most part, it's just survival within the hatchery system and, you know, being able to handle the hatchery environment. If you take a wild brook trout and, and put them in a hatchery, you can probably get it to feed on pellets eventually, but it's not going to be happy there. But we've got brood stock of brook trout in our hatchery systems that have been there. You know, just it's basically like sped up evolution, so to speak. You're just hand selecting certain uh, brood characteristics. Um, but with wild fish, you know, they're not used to the hatchery environment whatsoever. And so, you know, they're just not adapted to taking to a pellet. And so a lot of times we'll start with plankton and we'll put like sea monkeys in the tank with the, the young fish, the larval smallmouth, and they'll start consuming that. And then we'll mix in a little bit of feed mm -hmm. and they just kind of pick at it, you know, and then eventually we, you can kind of wean them off and get them onto feed. Um, but honestly, you know, a pellet raised fish you know, it, it's not the same as, as a fish that's, you know, in the wild and, and feeding on natural forage. And so my preference is always to put them in the ponds and let them feed on minnows so that they're ready to go. There's no transition from say, pellet. Is there a learning curve for them? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. You know, with our trout, for example, they're just, all they know is the pellets coming by them, you know, under the roof of the Corsi Springs hatchery, there's no detritus that's in the water. There's no leaves falling in. There's no bugs falling in. It's just pellets, pellets, pellets. So when they go out, you'll actually see them instinctually grab detritus that's floating down the river, a leaf, you know, um, 
a bug. You know, they'll, they'll eat bugs, but they're just grabbing it because all they know is like stuff floats by me. I eat it. It's pellets. And so there's definitely a transitionary time where they just don't really know how to feed themselves properly. Um, and it takes them a little while, but they, they can transition to wild feed. And that's when you see the fins starting to grow back. Um, you see the color change because they're eating wild food that's much more nutritious than the, than the pellets. Um, and it helps to stock fish at a smaller size because they transition much quicker uh, because they haven't been pellet fed like for a full year before they were stocked. Mm. And so it's pretty interesting to, to watch, you know, the, the um, certain trout streams like, you know, it's always said like they're caught out, you know, they're all caught out, <laughs> you know, the day that they stock them. But we go back and we'll sample some of them from for their wild populations and we'll see stocked fish still in the stream. But now they've got their wild colors, their fins have come back. Um, so it's, it's a real treat for an angler to go to a place like Dry River, for example, uh, where they can survive year round and they'll hook, you know, a, a ton of eight inch, six inch, eight inch wild fish. And then they come across that 13 incher that was hiding under a log now because it's, you know, it knows to hide and it's eating natural food. And it, it's just a nice, uh, nice way to, to surprise an angler for that particular fishing trip. So no, yeah, that, guys, that's, that's really good information. And then I, I, I'd be, uh, I really need to ask this last question. What are the three trout species that you guys are raising right now? Are you raising all, all three or are you just raising rainbows? It's four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the tiger now too? Yeah, we got the wow. tiger now. Yeah. So we have the brook trout, the brown trout and the rainbow trout. Um, and that's pretty much been our bread and butter for many years. We've dabbled in tiger trout in the past, um, but we had trouble raising them. This was many, many years ago. Um, and we recently started to get back into it um, just as a different opportunity for anglers. Uh, we also wanted to see whether these fish uh, would survive better within some of our hatcheries. Because like I said, you know, our hatcheries are, they're crowded and there's, there's sometimes disease issues, with, you know, within the population, just like if you're raising cows, you know, on a farm. And so um, cert, every hatchery is different and each species survives better at, at uh, certain hatcheries. And so with Corzy, we, we were experimenting with the tiger to see how they would do and they do very well. Uh, the hatchery guys love them. The anglers love them. There's just so much excitement of trying to catch my first tiger. Mm -hmm. And on the website, under the uh, stocking page, we actually list the species that we stock each day that we stock the rivers and, and lakes. And so if you're interested in catching a tiger, uh, this year, look for tiger trout next to the the stocking, and then go get them. They're they're, I, I'm told they bite a bear hook, so <laughs> it should be fairly easy to catch. Guys, and I'm gonna link everything that he talked about in the episode description. Uh, that way you can find it again. You know, go go to the website. It's they have fantastic information, and their the your website is so easy to actually navigate. It's Thanks. really well done. Yeah, we're we're very proud of it. You know, we sometimes get mixed reviews. The look of the website is phenomenal. It's just it's better than anyone out there. Um, but you know, sometimes it is hard to, to find your way around things, but I think we have it, we've improved it much more than it was in the past. Um, and, and you can, uh, you can find a lot of great information on there and our social media channels too, our YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, we're posting stuff on a fairly regular basis. Um, it's not always fishing, but you know, we do a lot of stuff with this agency. It's all wildlife, whether it's an endangered species, a rusty patch bumblebee, or a you know loggerhead shrike, a black bear, trout, bass, wildlife in Virginia. We're we're the we're the game in town. So uh, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of management decisions to make, a lot of conservation based decisions to make, and not that many people to do it. So we work as hard as we can to get uh, good projects on the ground. Well, you know, thank you again for coming on. I mean, I always love ha having everyone on from the DWR. It's always great information, and really just to establish that ability to communicate with everybody else. I always feel like the issue is when there's a miscommunication between, you know, whether it's like the bass fisherman, the catfish fisherman, um, or any organization. And, you know, guys, that's the whole reason we're doing this is just create better communication and have the conversations. If you don't have the conversations, you can't grow and move past to even solve a problem. And, and to whether you're a hunter and you care about the woods or if you are a fisherman, we all care about the bodies of water. We all actually, whether you're a tribe of trout, catfish, whatever, you, do, you still want the bodies of water to, to be healthy for generations to come. So thank you guys so much for coming on and, yeah, continue the work. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.